I don't care what your vocation is, what your goal is. If you work hard every day, you treat people fairly every day, you're in respect. It's Kenny Gilling! Sometimes the GM is there to change the direction of the story, but the story is always about the superstar. Who was Adam Pierce the wrestler? Everything I did was geared towards receiving a negative reaction. You had an opportunity early on with WWF. Why didn't that work out? I had talks with WWF and WCW at the same time, even with ECW, and I turned down their offer too. Brock Lesnar giving you two F5s and your pants splitting. They split on the first one, which was hilarious. Five-time NWA champion. Imagine that. Five times. We are finally making this happen we are thank you for making the time i'm elusive you are <laughs> you are <laughs> it's only but worked. six months it's official it's official we're here we're doing it we are officially doing it it wouldn't yeah i guess maybe like survivor series last year i think we started talking about this that sounds right yeah, yeah we man. are money in the bank yeah toronto <laughs> your hometown that is my hometown so welcome to my hometown and welcome home thank you yeah, it feels good to be home does it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not home for very long here, but yeah, it feels good to be You're here for a long time. You're here for a good time. That's the one. That is it. Are people so surprised when they find out that Adam Pierce was actually a wrestler? I think it depends what people you're talking to. Are we speaking specifically of WWE fans, yeah. the universe, as it were? Yeah. Yeah. I would say the majority of them are, are they give you a look. It's almost like Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Yeah. I, for almost 20 years. Yeah. Damn near 20 years. Yeah. I always want to say, well, you, you think people just get, find themselves in a, in a wrestling general manager's position having never had any wrestling experience? Like, right. Just, yeah, you have, like, when you look back at all of the different general managers, there's some sort of wrestling, like Teddy Long was a, a manager and also a referee. A referee. For years. Yes, of yeah, course. Right. It's not like you just fill out a job application on like Indeed.com or something. <laughs> yeah. What are your previous wrestling experiences? Well, no, I bagged groceries. Mm, oh. I've watched it before. Yeah, right. Yeah. So certainly you must then know everything about it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, 20 years as a wrestler. But then when you look at your pedigree, it's like, well, yeah, it makes sense why you're so good there. Well, I appreciate that. Five-time NWA champion. Imagine that. Yeah. Five times. You know, I talk to R-Truth about this sometimes, R-Truth, former NWA champion as well. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much of the modern audience today realizes the, the impact that people wearing that championship, the 10 pounds of gold, have had on our industry. It's mind-numbing. Well, when you look back at the entire lineage, you know, and it's like, it's Flair and it's Dusty Rhodes yeah. and it's Harley Race and you know, The so Godfathers. It's incredible. It's, ins it's insanity. Just to have your name included in that list, I've said this a million times. I don't find myself in the position I am today without the NBA title. Mm. And I always took it upon myself, even uh, in my era. So that would have been 2007 when TNA uh, relinquished the title till 12, 2012. I approached those years and every time I had to defend the NBA championship in a manner that I thought Harley would or Jack Briscoe would. It wasn't about wearing 10 pounds of gold to the ring. It was about carrying on a lineage and giving it the respect that those guys did. Mm -hmm. And I know having had conversations with Dusty and with Rick and the people who were in, in a similar position, obviously in a different um, time and space than I was, mm -hmm. they appreciated the way that I wore that championship. Do you think you could still go in the ring now? hundred percent right now. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> How much are you paying me? Ah, uh, yeah, right. That's, I, I don't want to wrestle. What are we talking about yeah. here? I don't want to either. Stop <laughs> asking me. God, they, they want to know. They do. And I appreciate that. Those that know, know. Yeah. But you're done, done. I've been done. Been done for 10 years. Yeah. December 21st of this year will be 10 years to the day I had my last pro match. Now, well, now I have to back up. If you rewind five years or so, I guess you could say that I hold a singles victory over Shinsuke Nakamura, which was in the main event of a SmackDown. <laughs> this is true. And the last tag match I had, if I'm thinking about that, was as partners with Braun Strowman for the uh, world tag team title against the Hurt Business, where I got beat. So It feels like at some point in time, there's a storyline where the general manager of Raw, who's a former NWA World's Heavyweight Champion, mm -hmm. and the general manager of SmackDown who's also an NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. I feel like I know where you're going with this. Feels like there's something there. Yeah, there's something there. There's a lot of air and opportunity between 
Mr. Aldous and I would say. But here's the thing, like, you have to want that. And I don't think he wants that. Ooh. You thought I was going to say that. <laughs> Yeah. No, that'd be fun. I, I think uh, neither one of us, neither Nick or I are ever going to angle for uh, a position in the spot like that, like that. I think we're both content and very happy and very honored to have the positions we have currently in WWE. It's, there's only one general manager for the show. So mm-hmm. it's highly important. It has been um, the pinnacle of my professional performing career. And I hope that continues into the future. And, but as I've said a hundred times, privately, publicly, um, I ain't afraid to get my hands dirty either. So if the situation calls for it, I'm sure Nick would be down for it. And I think there's a, a whole litany of NWA fans who have played that what if game. Because mm. I think our names are always connected when people talk about that, especially in the modern era, quote unquote. Yeah. What would happen? That, that'd be, I think that'd be fun for a lot of different groups of wrestling fans. What are the challenges that come with the on-screen performances of being a general manager? Because it's a lot of screen time. Yeah, sure. And I'm sure it's a lot of remembering names and places and matches and like making sure you're saying the right thing at the yeah, right time. And it's live TV. Right. Yeah, so that, that's awesome. I always say this position, okay, it's a supporting character on a television show that by definition isn't there to overshadow or step on the superstars. They are the beacons that we want the eyes focused on, but the general manager or the WWE official that I played for years before that, that's an informational conduit to what you just said, to make sure that everybody understands the context of what is happening with these larger than life characters that are on their screens every Monday and every Friday. Mm. And sometimes they're there to focus the direction of the story. Sometimes the GM is there to change the direction of the story, but the story is always about the superstar. Mm. And as you said, that's highly important, you know, and it's fun. I have a lot of fun. So I think a lot of men struggle with not being able to sleep well at night and not being able to lose weight. And when I turned 40 recently, I realized it was gonna take more than great workout routines and eating healthy to really feel my best. I needed to take my health into my own hands. And that's what I did with Merrick Health. Merrick Health is the premier health optimization platform empowering you to maximize your longevity and performance with the confidence that comes from having experts in your back pocket. Merrick Health offers cutting edge diagnostic labs, concierge health coaching, and expert clinical oversight. They support clients like me in achieving their health and fitness goals. Think of this as kind of like looking under the hood of what's going on in your body and giving you a baseline of where your numbers are at and then seeing what you can do to either raise those numbers or lower those numbers. I can now say that at 41 years old, I am the healthiest I've been in my entire life, and I have the numbers to back that up. Everyone who orders the optimization package receives extensive lab work, which is 84 carefully selected biomarkers, far more than any doctor would ever run for you. A custom lab report with actionable recommendations validated by their clinical research team and physicians, and a thorough analysis of your lab report and video call with Merrick Health. So to get the same panel and the same medical oversight that I got and I currently get, go to MerrickHealth.com slash CVV and use that code CVV to get 10% off. And I look forward to meeting the best and healthiest version of you. How many on-screen hits is it generally speaking, would you say? It depends. I think the most I've done, I heard Regal one time say he did 13 segments out of 16 on a raw. I don't think I've done 13, but I know I've done 10. Wow. Ten, set, uh, ten appearances in, in a three-hour broadcast is a lot. Yeah. And sometimes they are having to do with the, the similar content. And sometimes there is a bunch of just wacky shit. Can I say shit? Sure, you can say whatever you want. Sometimes, man, it's all over the place. You know, last Monday, I had one little kerfuffle backstage that I had to be a part of, and that was it. The week before that, I had five or six appearances with five or six different topics. So mm-hmm. it's it changes. What's your role with WWE? Behind the scenes, off camera. I am a producer of Raw, currently, previous to that, Raw and SmackDown. I have been director of live events, which means I have written and booked the territory brother, so to speak. (laughs) Did that for for a long period of time, which was a lot of fun. I was hired to be a coach and a trainer way back when, almost a decade. Just around about a decade now. So I spent the first 10 months at the Performance Center teaching, which was awesome in and of itself. How did this opportunity with WWE even come about in the first place? 
I call it time served. And the reason I say that is because you spend a lot of time in a vocation. You're going to run into everybody. You're going to run the gamut of the experiences and the people you run into and that you meet. And uh, yeah, I see this quote all the time, and I used it today when I tweeted something about Rhea Ripley. You know, always be kind to the people you see on the way up because they're the same faces you'll see on the way down. And I saw a lot of faces over 20 years. And thankfully, I guess, I uh, had a good enough track record with the work that I had done independently. I was a freelance professional that entire duration, save for the five years I was under contract to Ring of Honor, two of which I ran the company. Um, and that's where I got a taste of writing TV for the first time and booking a house show schedule and working contractually with talents to keep them in the fold and losing talents to other places and not to mention taking bumps. So it just came around one day where it's like, would you want to work for WWE? I got a phone call from a gentleman who I highly respect. Uh, and I won't name his name because I don't know how he would feel about that, but he posed the question to me. This was in 2012. He said, hey, man, if I told you that I think I could get you a job that you could have for the next 25 years, but it meant you'd never put your boots on again, what would you say? Mm. And I said, when do I start? And here we are. And when did you start? Two years after that phone call? So that was in 2012. I had my official tryout, which, by the way, I went through this, the, the tryout, the same tryout that every wrestler would go through in August of 2012. Like we're talking like the in the ring bumping all like, the above. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I went through the actual tryout. Um, I went in knowing obviously why I was at that tryout. So it was very, it was eye opening from that perspective because it was, it was in LA, which is where I know you live now, but um, to see a lot of the hungry kids, both independent wrestlers from the area and also athletes at that mm -hmm. time coming into this thing. And I'm like, man, everyone's vying for this, this dream. And in a sense, I was looking to turn the page yeah. on the dream, so to speak. And uh, yeah, it went great. That was August of 2012. This is pre-WWE Performance Center. And uh, they were still at FCW in Tampa. And they said, uh, hey, we want to bring you on, but we don't want to do anything. We're moving everything to Orlando. So it doesn't make sense for, me to, for you to move from San Diego to Florida just to move however long it takes us to get the ground broken in the building in blah, blah, blah in Orlando. Yeah. So let's just wait until the building in Orlando is up and running, and then we'll come back to this. And then that felt like it took forever. So then you're almost like a lame duck pro wrestler. Cause you know, at some point you're just biding time. You know, things change though, man. So 2012, 2013, 2014, I think, or at the end of 2013, I think I made my first uh, appearance as a guest coach at the PC. And then I did that for, all of 2014 and officially joined the team in May of 2015. What do you think was the biggest thing you learned kind of behind the scenes? You know, you'd worked as a wrestler for so long, but now you're behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest difference? Well, uh, aside from the scope of things, WWE, the pinnacle of the profession is for a reason. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think the, the thing that jumped out to me just from a, coaching and training perspective because that's what i was hired to do initially was man i had some really good trainers that taught me the same tenets that i'm being expected to pass on to the next generation mm. i feel like a glove in that place i feel like i think matt bloom who's still the head coach there would tell you that now um once you learn the job and you can do the job right and you have enough tools in the toolbox I always preach this to young wrestlers there are never enough tools that you can put in your toolbox mm you can sustain into the future in this business. You can have a future. You can have choices in your future. I didn't want to be, and I love the, the brothers and sisters out there taking bumps. I'm 46 now. 10 years ago when I was 36 and stepped away, I, didn't, I, I still had the same mentality I did when I was in my 20s. I don't want to be like my trainers who are 46, taking bumps mm. in the county fair, because that's all you know. Mm. Put tools in your toolbox. You've got something in your Instagram bio that I love. Work hard, treat people fairly, earn respect. That's it. Where's that from? That is from um, my parents, largely. And they never said those words to me. Work hard is my dad. He was an industrial mechanic for 30 years. Retired. Then realized he hated being retired. Went back to work. 
worked at Clark County Reclamation Water District in, in Vegas for another 20 years. Wow. Retired again. It's finally retired now. He just built a house near me in Florida. Treat people fairly as my mom because you're going to have days, man. And I, people always, when they ask me about treat people fairly, I said the key word in that is fairly. You hear do unto others as you would have done unto yourself, mm. right? But sometimes some people need to get slapped too. So it's about fairness. Treat people fairly. <laughs> you know, speak softly, but carry a big stick, that mm. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, that's my mom. And earn respect is that is how you succeed. And I don't care what your vocation is. I don't care what your, your goal is. If you work hard every day, you treat people fairly every day, and you do those two things often enough for long enough, you're in respect. Yeah, it's almost like an equation here, right? It is. Work hard plus treat people fairly equals. Equals in respect. Yeah. That's it. Mm. I'm your proof, I think, <laughs> unless they're all lying to me. I mean, I think, you, I think you've done it. <laughs> I try. Yeah. I try. People are so familiar with you as the authority figure or the general manager. Who was Adam Pierce, the wrestler? And, oh, the wrestler? Yeah. Oh. Adam Pierce, the wrestler, the scrap daddy. There's only one. Scrap iron Adam Pierce five times and NBA World's Heavyweight Champion was dead set every night I put my boots on into drawing negativity at all costs, at any cost. Everything I did was geared towards receiving a negative reaction <laughs> from the paying customer. Period. I love the the just the your, the sparkle in your eye as you say that because it was the most fun I've ever had doing anything in life. Because you can think about it, I can insult, denigrate, and cut down a room full of people. Whether it was two people in Indianapolis, the smallest crowd I ever worked in front of, actually two people, two people, and the ring broke in the first match. <laughs> what my payment payment was half a case of Mountain Dew that I stole from the promoter. And the phone off his desk and in, in, in his office, CM Punk can verify this. <laughs> that phone hung in my mom's kitchen for like 15 years. Was Punk on the same show? I, don't, I can't remember if he was there or if he had just heard the lore, but he knows the story of the phone. That was Indianapolis. Two people. Was, there, was it a snowstorm? Was there some sort of no, reason? No, it was just oh. brothers, brother and okay. You know what I mean? And sometimes as you, as you have, I'm sure, come across stories in your wrestling uh days in reviewing people like me you find these ridiculous stories that can't possibly be true but absolutely are so there were more people in the back than there were 100 percent. but the yes. show went on yeah the, well i mean the first match went on and the ring broke wow yeah. and the brother's like well i mean i can't pay anybody the hell you can't what can i take from this <laughs> flea market we are oh there's half case mondu so whether it was in front of two people there or at the tokyo dome because i was i've been blessed man yeah. At the Auditorio de Tijuana in Mexico, I've worked everywhere and have been proud to do it. So if you saw my interview with Adam Copeland or Christian Cage, they both talked about how they're in the best shape of their lives. What's their secret? It's planking. And they both came together to design a product that makes this exercise comfortable, functional, and fun. And it's called Pure Plank. And the best part about it is you can start planking in just three minutes a day. I've been doing it every day and I can tell you Pure Plank is such a good workout. Pure Plank's signature soft rubber padding ensures that planks are comfortable no matter how long you hold them and their handles guide you into the perfect plank position every time with optimal body alignment. Look, the problem with planking is that it's boring and it's uncomfortable and Pure Plank has solved that with the mat and the handles. And when you grip onto those handles, you can really feel the burn. Plus they have an awesome app which gives you a wide variety of different exercises. And they were kind enough to create the discount code CVV for anybody watching this that wants to save a little bit of money. So click that link in the description or in the pinned comments and enter the code CVV to save yourself 10% at gopureplank.com. That's the code CVV at gopureplank.com. Is it difficult? Was it difficult 10 years ago? to hang them up and know you weren't going to do it again. No, really? No, it was time. And, and I think wrestling fans, they really have a hard time when I say it and I say it with conviction because it's true. Yeah. Like I was 36. My, um, my babies were new to this world and I had an opportunity to turn the page and I thought it would be ridiculous of me and very selfish not to. Not to at least explore it, because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Um, but yeah, you know, I had worked 
a long time and amassed a lot of tools not to put those tools to good use, you know, and, and had been prepared along the way. Like I said, Ring of Honor, Carrie Silicon owned the company at the time before it went through its transitions, gave me the opportunity to to succeed and fail on the fly, booking a a touring schedule and writing and producing television for a bunch of guys in that locker room from 07, 08, 09, 2010 Ring of Honor. You look at that locker room, a bunch of those brothers I work with today still, we all yeah. cut our teeth at the same time. So it was a very special time and a very special crew. You had an opportunity early on with WWE, WWF at the time. Why didn't that work out? I, uh, me, who's me? Um, <laughs> oh, that's the end of the it, sentence. It's, yeah. cho- it's choices. Everything is choices, right? So this was 98, 99, and I was young and up and coming. And this is not pre-internet because the internet existed, but it didn't exist nearly at the capacity or the way the world works with it or around it or because of it now. Um, but I had some buzz and I had talks with WWF at the time and WCW at the same time and little conversations even with ECW and WCW's, I don't want to say offers, but what I thought they could offer seemed to be more appealing to me at that period of my life. And I turned down their offer too. <laughs> so here we are. Turned down New Japan. Sorry, I've turned everybody. I've said no a lot of times to a lot of people. I'm that guy. Was this just betting on yourself? Is Always. That what, was it Always. the idea of I'll say to no to them because there'll be something better down the road? I don't know that at 20 years old, you think like that. Mm. I didn't, I don't think I had that thought. Um, you know, I really made hard Finkel upset. And he was a real big proponent of mine at that period of time. Had a tryout scheduled in Connecticut at the Tracks facility, as it was called then, basically the warehouse. And at the same time, was having conversations with JJ JJ Dillon and Paul Orndorff in Atlanta at WCW. Mm. And Paul Orndorff said to me, "Look, I can guarantee we will offer you more than you will get there. So you should come here." And I believed him. I believed him. So I canceled my trial with WWF at the time. And you had to do that with Howard Finkel? With Howard Finkel. Yeah. And he was none too happy. Um, not angry, because I don't think Howard could be angry. I never saw that in him. He was always great to me, but I could tell he was disappointed. Then I went to WCW at the power plant, had a week there, uh, had a great week there, because you heard, used to hear horror stories of how people were treated at the, at the power plant. I was not treated poorly in any way, shape, or form. I had a trial match against Bobby Walker, hard work Bobby Walker. I don't know if you remember that name. If you don't look him up, he had no intention of making me look good in this trial match whatsoever. Did not want to be in the ring with me. Did not want to put me over. We had a uh, four-finger stinker, as some would deem it, a horrible match. And I went into the office of J.J. Dillon, and Dusty Rhodes was in there. Then... Uh, Dusty said, well, how do you think that went, kid? And I said, I think it was the shits. And he just nodded and then pushed the contract in front of me. And I was like, interesting. But I went home and, and uh, had that looked at by my, my attorney. And I was engaged to be married at the time, not to my wife now, to another lady. And her parents were not fond of their daughter moving to Atlanta, Georgia, from suburban Chicago at a, at the, at a very young age at that point. And, uh, I said, okay, I'm not going either. And didn't mm. go. Mm. And what immediately followed that? Just continuing to work on the Indies? Still brothering on the Indies. <laughs> brothering. There, there, was a, <laughs> there was a group called WXO that had, I came to find much later, had paid for national syndication. So I was on that for three weeks, and then it fizzled up and disappeared. So this would have been 2000, 2001. And then I moved from Chicago to California to get away from wrestling. And uh, never got away from it. Kevin Kelly and uh, Kevin Kelly hooked me up with a promoter named Rick Bassman, who ran a company called UPW in LA. Yeah. They were a low end developmental territory for WWE at that period of time. And uh, he said, Hey, you should call Rick. And Christopher Daniels said the same thing. He was working for them as well. And the litany of incredible performers I went through UPW's doors Samoa Joe, John Cena. Edge and Christian worked there. Ray Mysterio worked there. Diamond Dye, Russell Diamond Dallas Page there. I mean, everybody at one point or another went through UPW. So I kind of I got back in the business, back back on the uh, on the old uh, 
on the bike and kept riding. How long California. were you away from it? You moved to California to get away from it. I there. moved in Was November weeks, 2000, months? and maybe, maybe four months, maybe four months. And uh, during that period of time, I I had I had met, moved in with, started a life with the woman who would become my wife to this day, the mother of my children, best thing that ever has happened to me or ever will happen to me. And she's like, "What are you doing? I thought you were getting away from wrestling." I was just like, man, I am what I am. What were you going to do? Who work? knows? Oh, you didn't even know? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I am the idiot that moved across the country for love. I met my wife. Might as well tell this story. Yeah. My brother, Joe, was in the Navy. Joe, thank you for your service. I love you. I'll see you soon. He was stationed in San Diego. I'm living in Chicago where we grew up. Hmm. I always said, hey, when you get discharged from the Navy, I'm going to come out to wherever you're stationed. We're going to pack up your car and we're going to drive. If we can drive wherever you're at, we'll drive home. Mm -hmm. Great. So this was in 2000, June of 2000. He says, all right, I'm getting discharged the week before your birthday. Awesome. My birthday is June 24th. Great. So I have buy a one-way ticket out to California. I fly out to California. I get there and he goes, all right, man, it's great to hear bad news. Uncle Sam's keeping me for another three weeks. I'm like, I bought a one-way ticket. Yeah, I got to get home. And I got to figure out how I'm getting home. He goes, well, you're here for a week anyway, right? Yeah. Well, so we might as well party for a week, which we did, which at that period of time, pre 9-11, you could just walk across the border into Mexico. So we did that several times. And on a Thursday, I was in a bar called Club A on Avenida Revolucion in Tijuana and uh, saw this brunette across the room. And here we are almost 25 years wow. now. Wow. Nuts. Met in Tijuana. In Tijuana, in a dirty bar. Five dollars all you can drink. What? Five dollars all you can drink. <laughs> five five bucks, brother. That was the day. That was Jeez. back in the day. Six. Are they hoping you stay in Mexico? Is that the the hook here? I don't know what they're hoping. <laughs> five dollars. Five bucks all you can drink. drink. Yeah, man. Yep. Six months later, I'm living in on a, her couch with her three roommates that were all going to San Diego State University. They're like, who is the wrestler on the couch and why is he living here? Wow. That's nuts. Although moving from Chicago to California in November, I feel like that checks out. Fair enough. Yeah. I moved to Florida in December from there you go. Ohio. So you get it. I totally get it. And here we are. Wow. <laughs> what a story. She has funded, put up with, laughed with, cried with, gotten mad at. And been really grateful for my wrestling journey. <laughs> and I am grateful for her. That is every emotion possible. That's what this business will bring to you. How does your tryout with the San Diego Padres to possibly become the PA announcer, how does that fit into this whole story? That was awesome. And on a whim. I just was talking to my mother-in-law about this yesterday. She, she said to me, what would you have done if the Padres offered you the job? And I go, I don't know. I guess I would have taken the job. So I, uh, David Marquez, who ran, still runs championship wrestling, which used to be from championship Hollywood, yeah. wrestling from Hollywood. And I have been friends forever. We're going back to the nineties when he was still living in Missouri, running things with Harley race and Gordon Soley. I had a booking cancel on me. He tipped me off. Hey, the Padres are auditioning PA announcers because their guy just retired. And it was like the 10 year anniversary of the new ballpark. And he says, we should go. And I'm like, what are you talking about? We're going to do PA for baseball. He goes, it'll be fun. Let's go. So he drives down to San Diego. We get in my car. We go downtown by the ballpark. We have a couple of cocktails and we audition. And they kept me. They did not keep Dave. <laughs> He's pissed to this day about it. And they kept me along. They kept me along. And I got down. I was, I, I think technically I finished fifth, although I don't think they publicized past the top 10. I did three national broadcasts. That was a lot of fun. I love baseball. Can you give us a little taste of what you would have sounded like? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I can. It's, I can. Dude, the, the, the parallels I find looking at a baseball format to a wrestling format are very similar. Mm. So the PA announcer, again, is move, and now he's in the stadium. He's not necessarily featured on the television or radio broadcast, but for the in-house crowd. Yeah, he's the voice of God. He is directing yeah. the traffic. He is drawing the attention. He is moving your attention. He is informing you, mm -hmm. right? So he would let you know 
Now batting the second baseman, number five, Chris Van Vliet. This is amazing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's fun. My favorite part of that would be sitting in the in the in the you know in the press box, um, watching contemporaries from the broadcasting field. Vin Scully. I did an ESPN broadcast with Vin Scully. What? We did a little production. I mean, he was with the, the Dodgers forever. Yeah, he is. He called Hank Aaron's record-breaking home run when he when he when he That's, broke. I mean, Vin Scully is the man, right? On the Padres side of things, at that time, Dick Enberg was their TV voice. Mm. Another broadcaster, another legend. Yeah, there. Charlie Steiner was doing a radio broadcast for the Dodgers. Fernando Valenzuela, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm looking around the room at holy hell. All these people who have absolutely every accolade in professional baseball broadcasting to their credit and a pro wrestler who has never done this a day in his life. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I am a big baseball fan. Yeah. I grew up playing baseball. I played it in my 20s. My dad and I now have a tradition every year. We go to a different MLB stadium. I love it. Petco is definitely one of the best modern it's day beautiful. fields. Beautiful, yeah, it's beautiful. Like it's hard to any of the modern ones. It's hard to put them up against Fenway or sure. or Wrigley, right? I was say if you leave Wrigley out of it, we get Ri a fight. Yes, yeah. Chicago kid. F Fenway and Wrigley are one yeah. two for me. Yeah, but when you look at the modern ones, like Petco is so good. The way it's integrated yeah, into the city, so like nice. that. Pittsburgh is great too. Pittsburgh's another yeah. great one. Whatever they call the one in San Francisco now, I went to it. It's great. Pac Bell. Yeah. So good. My one regret, man, is uh, that ESPN game with the Dodgers. We're sitting in the catering or whatever you want to call it, eating before the, the ball game. We'd already gone through our pregame prep. I had everything, my notes, my liners, what I was going to read when, blah, blah, blah. Not to mention scoring the game, which was always fun if you really like baseball and you're yeah. scoring a major league yeah. game. Um, the K and the backwards uh -huh, K. Of course. Uh -huh. Pitch counts and all that stuff. Vin Scully walks in and everybody rose as if the king had just walked in and he was so oh guys it's just me everyone enjoy your meal you know and i was like man i if i don't ask vin scully for a picture mm -hmm. i will regret this and i already talked to him because you know the local uh, press in san diego you know they publicize all the pro local pro wrestler pa you know half joking tongue-in-cheek but i was was pretty good. The guy that hired Alex Miniak, he's still with the team. He was for sure. I sat next to him in a restaurant before we even went in to do the audition. And I go, this guy's the he wins now. Like he's amazing. And he got the gig and he was the right one to get the gig. But um, we're sitting there eating and I go, if I don't ask him for this picture, I'm going to regret it. So I'm getting ready to do this. And a guy walked up to him just as Vin Scully had sat down and started to eat. And I went, oh, not when he's eating. And Mr. Scully still took the picture, still all that. But I said, I'm not going to, I can't do it now. I can't do it. I can't eat uh, this guy or this, some guy. I don't know if you, what he was there for. He, I'm like, he ruined his meal. I can't do it. And I never did it. Hmm. No picture. Do you still believe in the mentality of take the photo? I believe in that mentality. I was not trained that way in, in a pro wrestling sense. Because think of how many, not even just wrestling legends you have backstage, but how many just you know, celebrities are there? Yeah. You're, you're saying take the photo now? I don't see any reason not to. Yeah. If you aren't disrespecting them, interrupting them, somehow, some way, causing uh, uh, disturbance, take the photo. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I think Why those, not? I think those are words to live by. Like, of course, you have your memories, but something about having that photo. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It's cool. You know, you just have to make sure you do it in the right context in the right period of time. Yeah. You know, don't be an idiot. Sure. Yeah. So often you post on Instagram, love somebody today. Every day. Try to. What do you mean? What do you mean by love somebody? I mean that as literal as I can say it. Love somebody today. Let me ask you this. Mm. You're a father. You're a husband. You work every day. You're living in California, which ain't cheap. Mm. There is stress every day in your life. All of that can bog you down. All of that can beat you up. All of that can make you want to have a drink. When you are thinking about love, 
Is there negativity associated with that in any way, shape, or form? Yeah. It centers me. It started looking, it started off of looking at social media and how negative and divisive I feel like it is needlessly. I don't think people put much thought into it. I think the natural negativity of the human experience just comes out people puke it out into the world and don't even really think about it well, it's because there's no repercussions on social media it's unfortunate yeah like but, if you say that stuff in real life someone's gonna punch in your yeah, mouth yeah you're gonna have a very bad day yeah <laughs> as my dad would say you are one choice away from having a very bad day but i would see this stuff and i'd be like man and my wife like she would notice it like what are you why are you in a bad mood you read somebody's words on the internet and it spun you up and I go, you're right. How come nobody, people are so quick to, I hate this, this sucks, blah, 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 blah. But nobody ever says, I'm happy. Yeah. I love you. Let's be friends. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I just did, it was kind of a social experiment just for me. I'm just going to post love somebody today and see, I wanted to see how many people would hate would respond with hatred if i'm being honest and really i don't really i've never seen it i yeah. don't think you how can you how can you <laughs> throw darts at the guy who's telling you to love somebody right how could you possibly be mad about that there's a lot of though in social media well it's easy for you to say or that must be nice it's like but i think with this idea love somebody yeah could i have the same person every day sure love your dog yeah love the guy in the street corner that said hello to you mm. Are you a guy that walks down the street when you pass somebody, you ignore them? Is that you? You don't strike well, me as that Well, I'm from Canada, guy. so I like to think we're pretty friendly. Right. right. Yeah. So, and I'm from Chicago, which if you're not from that area, people think Chicago, blue collar, maybe we're rough. No, we're not New York. We say hello. We get offended when you don't say it back. My wife, that was a hard thing for my wife. She's like, why are you always saying hello to everybody? And I'm like, you grew up in LA and you don't. Why don't you? <laughs> yeah. What is wrong with you people? Yeah. <laughs> I think the funny thing about LA is not that many people are from LA that live yeah, there. Right, it's crazy. So there's no real like Chicago or like I lived in Cleveland for five years, Toronto for sure. Like you feel like that's your city. Right. And you feel like the people that you're seeing in and around the city are your people. In LA, you're from all over the country or all over the right. world. There's no like allegiance to the city. So it's just kind of like, I'm in my own lane, do my own thing. Bringing it back to a sports thing, I think. That's why outside of the Dodgers and, and the Lakers, like there's no, who's really, there's no, this is my team in LA. There is your older Dodger fan, Showtime Lakers. Then they went through a period when they weren't the Showtime Lakers and the entire city didn't care about the Lakers until Kobe came around. And yeah. then all of a sudden we care about the Lakers again. <laughs> That's why no football teams stick around. I'm glad the Rams are there now and the Chargers, which still breaks my heart that they're in LA, but like, man. There was a direct correlation to how bad the weather is and how much you love your sports team. Think about it. Interesting. Buffalo, Cleveland, Green Bay, yeah. Chicago, Toronto. Then on the flip side, think about Phoenix and Miami and LA and San Diego. There you go. Right. It's interesting. a really interesting thing. And I'm sure somebody in the comments is going to go, well, what about the Tampa Bay Lightning? Yeah, yeah, because they're good right now. Yeah, right now. Yeah. You know what I say to that guy? Love somebody today. Yeah. Love somebody today. It's not hard. Yeah. I, you know, here's what I see back sometimes, and I feel for people that will say this to me. It, it, I want to, but I don't get it back. Love is not a transactional thing. You don't have to get it back to give it, right? It's like respect. And if you are doing it just to get it back, then, then yeah. you're not doing it for the right reason. And you're very wise. Right? You're like Yoda. <clears throat> That's our Anchorman quote, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> like a miniature Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> Covered in fur. <laughs> Baxter. <laughs> Bark twice if you're in Milwaukee. You know I don't speak <laughs> Spanish. It's one of the great movies. Ah, you're from San Diego. Well, you lived in San Diego for a long time. Yes. 15 years. Yes. yes. San Diego. Mm -hmm. My whales. Drink it in. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be a part of the Channel 4 News team. Oh, who would you be? Oh, who would I want to be? Yeah. I would want to be Brick. Of, of yeah. course. Brick I love Tamlin. Lamp. I love yeah. Lamp. Yeah. Are you just looking at things and saying that you love them? <laughs> I love Chris Van Vliet. <laughs> <laughs> I love Lamp. 
Let's go through some of uh, your greatest hits here in WWE. Oh, boy. You screaming war games recently was just perfect. Well, thank you. Did you feel like you had to live up to what William Regal had done previously? No. No. This is like uh, I would preach this to the students when I was training people to wrestle. If you throw a lot of chops in your match, what does the crowd do? Woo. Right. Yeah. When the crowd woos, who are they thinking about? Right. Not you. Not you, brother. Yeah. So the last thing I wanted to do was to say war games like Regal. So I actually went to him and I said, any thoughts on what you think this should sound like coming from me? And aside from him saying it shouldn't sound anything like me, he also said, you know, I only said that like four times and somehow they think I've been doing this for 30 years. He said, just do it like you do it. Yeah. So I did. And it was fun. It was, it was so good. Yeah. Because it, like, it came across like almost like an angry dad. Right. I, that's funny. You have figured out the secret to the majority of my performances. <laughs> what would angry dad Adam say? Bingo. There it is right there. There it is. How about Brock Lesnar giving you two F5s and your pants splitting? That was amazing. They split on the first one, which was hilarious. Um, I remember saying to Brock, I, I said, hey, I just want to, how, how do you grab for the F5? I know it's fireman's carry. And so he showed me how he's going to grab me. And I said, and don't worry, I'll get light for you. And he goes, you don't have to. And I said, I know I don't have to, but I will. <laughs> Brother, I got you. What a pro. What a freak athlete. Did you know they'd split the first time? No, I didn't split until I got in the back and everyone was laughing at the fact that I split my pants. And I was like, why don't you take two F5s and see what happens? Was he supposed to give you two? Because he gives you one, they and say, then his music starts playing. Yes. Then he picks you up for the second one. Hence the true professional that is Brock Lesnar. He listened to the crowd because they started chanting one more time. Yes. One more time, one more time, one more time. And I'm laying there, and I kind of look up. And again, professionalism, we made eye contact. Mm -hmm. And when the eye contact was sustained for longer than two or three seconds, I knew that one more time was about to happen, <laughs> which is cool. Yeah, and then we, really, brother. then we really saw your pants split. Yeah. Well, you know what? We got to give him a show. There was, I mean, you almost gave him a real show. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Got lucky there. <laughs> like, your backstage stuff with Brock was hilarious. Yeah. That uh, Brock with the flip phone. When he named his moose after me. That was funny. <laughs> the only thing I'm mad about, not mad, that's not the right word. He's going through, Brock's going through his, his soliloquy as he's messing with the flip phone, he can't get it to work. And he talks about he skinned the moose and he gutted the moose and the guts weighed. And he kind of looks at me and he goes, 220 pounds. And I wanted to go, hey, Brock, 240, brother. 240, 220, I'm skinny today. That's <laughs> Brock bringing out the flip phone was met with like audible laughs. Of like, course. It was so good. And then when he snaps it. Yeah, it snaps it like it's nothing. Yeah, well. Yeah. That was good stuff. Yeah, it was fun. How about the backstage stuff with Chelsea Green? Just being a total Karen. Always an experience working with Chelsea. Um, and easy to play off. When she would do her thing, and to this day when she does, it's almost like you don't have to say anything. I always tried to think about what would my face say to this person without a word coming out of my mouth? Mm. What, 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 what do my eyes say? You know, I'm... I th I'm pretty think I'm pretty good facially. Um, and there's a tip for younger wrestlers too, like sell everything with this, your eyes, your face. I always thought about it. Let Chelsea be Chelsea. And I just have to kind of react without saying anything. So much fun. So good. Yeah. The stuff you did with Bray Wyatt as Postman Pierce. Yeah. I thought it was so good. And now, what was it like for you working with him? He was great. Um, I wish we could have done more. Obviously, I think everybody that worked with Wyndham would tell you that. There was only I, Postman Pierce appeared once, well, just once. Um, but I thought, what a what a creative way in this world of of sports entertainment and pro wrestling. How do you again with the the WWE official or the GM being the informational conduit? What does that conduit look like? to the supernatural Wyatt family, to Bray, you know, mm. to the fiend, heaven forbid.
what would that look like? And when they, when the, when the, uh, the postman idea, when I read that, I was like, this is hilarious. It's going to be funny. And, and what was awesome about doing the playhouse with him is whether or not you were working specifically or strictly off a of script or not, you had a lot of creative leeway. He had all the leeway to make it as out there or as Bray Wyatt ish as he wanted it to be. Mm. And I remember saying, Hey man, how did like, course we have the point we have to get across but like i just kind of want to be in awe of this place and look around and i wanted to say what the fuck can i say fuck on here you can say whatever you want i wanted to i wanted to i, I stop you boop i can watch and i walk in the door i go what the? and then he starts talking but like it was fun i still have the costume what's it like when you're actually there like when you see it the way the the fun the firefly fun yeah. house I mean, you know, it's a set sure. backstage at our, in an arena, so it looked different depending upon what setting we're in. But like the puppets and just the atmosphere and the music, the creepy ass music, it's a lot of fun, man. And I think what's so great about those segments is it makes you realize how kind of weird kids shows were when we were growing up. Go back and watch Pee Wee's Playhouse. I don't know if that's really a kid's show, is it? I mean, it was, I think it was marketed to kids, wasn't it? It was on Saturday mornings, wasn't it? Yeah. When it first came yeah. out. Yeah, there was definitely some adult humor. Was, a lot of it was bizarre. Yes. Yeah, Mecca Lecca High, Mecca Heine Home. Very bizarre. We had some in Canada that only my fellow Canadians will understand this, but like the polka dot door and you watch it back now and you're like, what is going on? There was like, there'd be, these, there'd be a man and a woman. And then one of them would disappear and turn into this like giraffe like a character mm. called the Pokeroo that could only say Pokeroo. Pokeroo, okay. Pokeroo, Pokeroo. And I watch it back now and I'm like, what is, what was this? What was consumed prior to the taping of this? <laughs> prior to the polka dot door. Yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with Captain Kangaroo or of am course. I dating myself? Yes. What? We're similar in age. Are we? Yeah, I'm 41. You, well, you look great. I look it's old. Very kind. Yes. Something wrong with Captain Kangaroo. <laughs> to your point these shows <laughs> if we stay if we do a deep dive i wonder what uh there was another canadian show called mr dress up and he kept all the uh, <laughs> he was he's a legend he's a man is a saint but he would get all of the the things that would be uh i guess the costumes and things from the tickle trunk <laughs> yeah moving along yeah <laughs> <laughs> did you say Tickle trunk? The tickle trunk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you getting up in Bobby Lashley's face is great. And firing him. And firing him. And firing him. And catching yourself dropping an mf -er live on TV. So, <clears throat> I don't know that I'm giving anything away that I shouldn't when I say this. Um. I was supposed to say it without saying it. They wanted to come across like it was being muted or beeped for TV. And they asked me, do you think you could say motherfucker without saying the ucker part? And I went, I am a professional profanity slinger. Of course I can. <laughs> and I did. And there was no need for anyone to hit the button at the network. I'll have you know. It was very well it done. It was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Very <laughs> Father Mucka. <laughs> <laughs> That was a lot of fun too. Interesting to fire Bobby Lash. I fired, and I think I only fired Bobby and I fired Sonya Deville. Those are the two people I fired. Does it make you feel good when you fire someone? Like Bobby, I feel like he had it coming. He deserved it, right? Well, he was reckless in yes. the way he, he was treating our staff, our security forces, and he shoved me against the wall. That's probably not good. Mm -hmm. Sonya was just undermining and conniving and just a general uh, horrible human being to me at all times so she deserved to be fired mm -hmm. but i did i drafted her this year i brought her back mm -hmm. so if she does it again it's my fault mm. that's probably a questionable decision wouldn't you think i would think so yeah, for that history maybe there? a dumb decision per, well see how it plays out that's a good point yeah that, that is the phrase i would like to give all fans of wwe see how it plays out let's see how it plays out yeah right it'd be really interesting to see how this plays out watch the show watch the show enjoy the show perhaps Less armchair quarterbacking mm. and more being a fan of the thing you say you're a fan of. If only, right? If only. I'm still a fan. Are you? Definitely. We're doing this. Yes. Because we're fans. 
I feel like when you can remove yourself from it and watch it in the same way you would watch any other television program or a movie, you really start to enjoy it a lot more. I think, I don't think you can enjoy it if you don't do that, right? Yeah. Well, it's tough. I am, uh, I am not a movie critic. I'm not a, a music critic. I'm not a television critic. I'm not a critic of anything except for Green Bay Packer football, which I will go batshit loony over when they play horribly. Um, but I find when I do that, I don't enjoy the experience nearly as much as it would, to your point, if I had just sit back and, and try to watch things. I, I, I say this to myself, watch this like your children will watch it. Mm. And obviously we have a different frame of reference. We're not children anymore, but when you kind of remove the analytics from the experience, yeah, you actually experience it. Is Aaron Rodgers the goat? He's up there. Um, I think he needs to win another Super Bowl. Were well, you kind of like, as a Green Bay Packers fan, were you kind of happy, you know, with him going to the Jets and playing, was it two plays? It's No, I wasn't happy that I got injured at all. Uh, with him leaving Green Bay, I thought it was obvious that's what was going to happen. I was surprised it didn't happen the season previous. Mm. Just looking at how Green Bay handles their quarterback situation, they did the exact same thing when they had Brett Favre, our, another one who's always been in the GOAT conversation, yeah. maybe not so much now uh, compared to the heyday, but Aaron Rodgers sat behind Brett Favre for three years, and then it was, you know, as, as uh, Grandma Pierce would say, shit, get off the pot, time to play. Did the same thing. He drafted Jordan Love. He sits for three years. He invests first-round money in a quarterback. Mm -hmm. He has to play. Yeah. And here we are. Tom Brady's got to be the go, right? I don't think anybody's going to win to the level that he has. I and I, when people try to argue against Brady being the greatest of all time, I'm like, but what? It, how? Yeah, right. I mean, you can't argue with that success. Pat Mahomes is incredible, and he has the potential to beat Brady numbers eventually. Yeah, but look at those numbers. I know, and it's not just him. He's going to have to have a system in place and. Uh, not, not saying Belichick's the greatest of all time, but he is. I don't know how he kept that machine rolling with yeah. the interchangeable parts every year and seemed like for, not seemed like, they were at the top forever. Yeah. And then Brady played that well till he was 45. Insane. It's not like you look at him at 43 or 44 and go, no, you slip him. Mm, no, wow. you no he wins the way. Super Bowl. He went to Tampa <laughs> and did the same damn thing. Yeah, it's and incredible. And beat my Packers and mm. that night. Perhaps I had a few drinks. Perhaps. Perhaps. He needs to be like studied. Like unreal. And I also, without talking too much about football here, I, I feel like there's a whole new generation of quarterbacks that are gonna go, I want to do the TB twelve method. Like I wanna play well into my yeah. maybe late thirties or forties. I wanna do the stretching and whatever other things he does with his diet. I think we see I mean, I just look at the my son's sixteen and he, he's a tight end, but he's Six three and a quarter and two hundred and ten pounds, and already a better athlete than I ever was ever in my life. And I'm like, what is in the food? These athletes are insane. They're faster. They're bigger. They're stronger. I will still whip you, boy. <laughs> Actually, I don't even know if I can say that in a couple of years. Well, I probably can't say that. But man, it's just it's nuts. But to your point, I think you're right. I think athletes just take care of themselves better today. Does your son want to be a pro wrestler? Not a chance. No. Do you not want him to be a pro wrestler? Or is it he's just not interested? Um, I don't think I would ever put constraints on either of my children. Yeah, that's the full stop. Whatever they want to do with their lives, yeah. I'm in full support of. I had great people who thought being a pro wrestler was an insane idea. I had great people in my life who were all about if you want to do it, do it. I think that's kind of where I lean. Um, they watch my children. They watch uh, casually. And obviously they know what their dad does for, for work and, and they're into it. You know, when I do something on TV, they think it's funny or whatever. Their friends think it's funny, but I don't think either one of them really have any aspirations to go that route. They've never said that. Um, I used to, <laughs> when they were little, I had a problem because I was a heel for, 15 of the 20 years I wrestled, I yeah. had a real issue. I never wanted my kids to see me perform because I, especially they were very young during that period of time. And I thought, I don't know that they are going to be able to cognitively separate the fact from fiction here. If they see their dad 
being a vile human being as I was wont to do. As I said to you, that was my goal in every situation was to breed as much negativity as I could. I, I don't want people to cheer for me. I want them to want this guy to beat me every time I'm in, whether I'm wearing the 10 pounds of gold or not. I want people behind this guy. Uh, I just, I never let my kids see me wrestle. Never. They thought I worked at the airport because <laughs> daddy was always going to the airport. When did they find out you didn't work at the airport? When they were old enough to realize, like, I have a picture of my son. He, when he figured out, it, like, I had my gear bag, he would come and sit in it when he was, like, two and three and four. And then, you know, they figure out, you know, what, what are these boots for with a P on the side of them? And these, what, you never wear spandex around the house, like, and these robes and all this crap. And just, you know, they figure it out. But I just didn't want to, I didn't want to tarnish you understand what I'm saying? I get what you yeah. mean. Yeah. It was difficult. Who are you most excited about on Raw right now? Man, it's such a new era. There's a lot to be excited about. Um, I'm such a fan of Seth Rollins as a person and have had such longevity with him in different places in our wrestling journeys and kind of been intertwined that I always enjoy uh, him as a performer, his thought process, how he goes about cultivating his character and how that's changed over the years. And I am a super fan of Ron Breaker. I think he is as blue chip as blue chip can be. And he's still so raw and so young in our industry. Obviously the pedigree is what it is. Mm. When you got Hall of Fame dad and uncle, you know, it's kind of, bred into you, I think, from from uh, from that standpoint. But he's such an open book and willing to try just about anything. His athleticism is insane. It's insane. It's nuts. And I was talking to him, <clears throat> being such a football fan, I don't have to go back to football, but, mm. you know, he played in the league and he was a, t uh, a fullback and then a running back. And I just, I remember, I, I said, how much you weigh right now? And he said, right around 250. I said, what? would you play at? I assumed he played at a similar way. And he said, no, it was like 215, 220. And I'm like, oh my God. He goes, yeah, it was just so much faster then. And I go faster, <laughs> faster than this. How could he be? You know what I mean? <laughs> I, like he was almost disappointed. Like uh, I, I was such a great athlete at one point in my life. <laughs> what are you nuts? And that's the opposite <laughs> of what you hear. Most guys are bigger in the league to absorb the, yeah. all the hits. Like when you see a lineman after they retire, they lose like 50 pounds. Well, apparently Braun was lighter and faster and dare I say more maniacal. Yeah, that just sounds terrifying. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Man. <laughs> I'm so glad we were able to make this happen. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been yeah. fun. Uh, gratitude's such a big part of my life. Same. And I start and end every day saying out loud three things I'm grateful for. And that's how I wrap up every interview. Awesome. So Adam, what are three things in your life you're grateful for? My health. Um, I don't think, I think we, as, as a society in America, don't value it enough. Um, never slow down, never grow old. I always tell my kids. So my health, my family, the love and support that they have provided and continue to do so. Um, and the third Today, what's today? Today is a Friday. And we are in Canada and we are breathing Toronto air. And I'm grateful to be doing that with you. Appreciate you, my friend. My brother. Thank you. Love somebody today. <laughs>